Harold Crabb. Uh, Professor Weeder has been the dean, or was the dean of the School of Social Sciences at Sonoma State for more years than any of, how long was it? Twelve. Twelve years. She had a conversation in and of itself. <coughs> she remains a professor emerita of sociology at our university. She played a very important role in developing our Holocaust Memorial Group, and she was instrumental in assuring that one of the saplings from the Anne Frank tree would find a home of only eight homes at Sonoma State University. And if you have not been over there yet, you certainly need to go. It's a very moving experience. Professor Dieter studied at New York's Wurzweiler School of Social Work at Yeshiva University and at UC's School of Public Health. Her doctorate was awarded by Cornell. She's published five books and many articles her most recent work is My Life with Lifers, Lessons for a Teacher, drawn from her work with Lifers at San Quentin. In 2013, she was awarded the Rio Hero Award from the Sonoma County Red Cross for her work at that prison. Professor Leader is part of a group that we refer to as the second generation of Holocaust survivors. It's very important that we hear their message and that we acknowledge that the effects of that trauma carry on for many generations in families. This past summer, Professor Reeder traveled to her ancestral home, Lithuania, a very important stop on her journey as a second generation survivor. Uh, please join me in welcoming back Professor Elaine Reeder. It's a pleasure to be here. There's no microphone, so I will have to project loudly. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay. Also, um, I have a PowerPoint, and my dear, wonderful TA from last semest semester, Danielle, is going to take care of it for me. Thank you. Um, how many of you have studied with me? Put your hands up. Oh, uh, not as many as I thought, because this is... Okay, so many of you might know me because I teach a lot about social justice. And when I retired from being the Dean of Social Sciences here, which was just a year and a half ago, I finally was able to have some space in my life to begin to deal with something that had long plagued me. And so I had written this story, and my plan is to show you the uh, pictures and read parts of the story and tell you parts of the story. And I would love for you to ask me questions, okay? Because I have not covered it all. There's lots more to say. And at the end, should any of you want a copy of this, all you have to do is email me and I will send it to you so that you too can read it. First slide, Danielle. I'm going to read you something. It begins as I turn out the lights and I prepare to settle down for the night. The room is dark, the bed is comfortable and cozy, and I eagerly await my restful sleep. But I am still awake when a cold feeling comes over my body. I begin to be anxious, for I know what is coming. All of a sudden, the fear takes over, visceral and terrifying. I am falling into a pit. It is large, emptying into abyss, an abyss that spirals downward. The spiral reaches into infinity, and my fall down this hole goes on forever without end. I am still conscious, and I begin to think that this life that I know will cease, and that everything I know to be a reality is in fact temporary. The life I live is an illusion, to be shattered and end with no control on my part. I will die, it is inevitable, and the world will go on without me, my existence wiped out in an instant. Completely conscious, I am falling forever into this pit. It is my death, and it will never end. The pit is dark, the farther I fall, the smaller it gets. There is no one to help or save me. I must deal with it myself, as I have done since the horror began, 
as I have done since I was 11 years old. My father said I would outgrow it. My husband held me when I was a young woman, telling me he was there for me. Now I have these day mares. They have come for 59 years. Will they ever end? And I continue to have that day mare, and I call it a day mare because it's when I'm falling asleep, but I'm not asleep, I'm awake. And I experience this falling, 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 falling forever into this pit. And this has been my experience for 59 years. I never put together where it came from. Why was I experiencing this until recently? One of my friends said to me not long ago, Elaine, it sounds like you had a childhood trauma. And I thought, I didn't have a childhood trauma. I grew up in a normal upbringing. And then I started to piece some things together. Let me tell you another little story, and then I will begin to unravel the story for you. We are sitting in a car in the dark. We are waiting, my brother and I, for our parents to emerge from the apartment in Brooklyn, New York, where they went upstairs hours ago. We continue to wait. When he went up, my father was hopeful and eager to meet with whomever he had come to see. He was wary, but anxious. Many hours later, my father emerges, almost carried by my mother, helped into the car as if he were an invalid. He's weeping, quaking, actually. He looks like a broken man. So much did he age in those few hours in that apartment. We don't know what happened, but we know something horrible occurred. Silently, we drive back to Boston, many hours away. We sit in silence, knowing that we should not say anything. Nothing more is ever said of that evening. My family guards the secret well. Over the many years since then, I've tried to understand what happened that night, but the pieces never fully came together. My father, Zalman Snayerson, Samuel, came to the United States in January of 1939. He had, there was only one visa allowed out of Lithuania. Well, I'm sorry, there were seven visas allowed out of Lithuania in 1939. He got the last visa possible. His sister was supposed to come instead, but my grandfather was ill. And so she said, you go, Zalman, and send for me. So he goes across Germany with a Nazi stamp on his Lithuanian passport, accompanied by an SS guard. He goes through Berlin, and he sees the buildup of World War II. He sees what's going on in Germany. He gets to Le Havre. He gets on a boat. He comes to the United States, and he lives a US life. He becomes a US Army uh, private. While he had been in Lithuania, he had been in the um, ski troopers. He had also, <coughs> excuse me, been in an underground Zionist movement in order to prove, make Israel a state. Uh, and he had been an Orthodox Jewish boy who went to yeshiva studying um, all of the Orthodox Jewish religion. So he was a multifaceted, very intelligent young man comes to the United States and becomes a junk dealer. Because what could he do with this heavy Eastern European accent? He went into business with an uncle of his. He moved to Boston, which is where he showed up. And then he met my mother uh, very soon thereafter. And they got married. And in 1944, I was born. In 1949, my brother was born. My father continued to have communication with his family from 1939 to 1941. In 1941, it was completely cut off because the Nazis had invaded Lithuania. Um, let's see. How about um, one of the slides? Next slide. Oh, dear. You can't really see it. Oh, will someone get the... Yeah, would you just shut the light for one minute? It didn't dim it. It dims. 20 years. 20 years we've waited for a dimmer. We've got it. <laughs> what a relief. Let's see if you can see them at least for a little bit. Oh, there, you there they are, and I can still read. 
Okay, leave me a little light. Okay. <laughs> All right, to the left is this handsome man. That's my father. He was about 19 at the time. In the middle is his brother Herschel. He was about 16, 15 or 16 at the time. To the right is Althea, my aunt. I used to look like her when I was young. In the left corner over here is my grandmother, Yentalea. Now I look like her. <laughs> uh, and beside him is my grandfather, Eliezer. I'm named for her, him, Elaine. So these are the family around 1938 before my father came to the United States in a coat that he actually wore over that I still have. Um, and he, um, let me see where I should go next. Um, so he, um, he received communication from his family regularly until 1941. And postcards were saying, Zalman, don't come home. The Russian army is looking for you because the Soviets had invaded Lithuania a year earlier. So it was now a, a Russian territory. And they said, don't come back because the Russians are looking for you to put you in the army. Stay away. They also kept saying things are getting very, very hard here. Please send money. What could a junk dealer in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1941 send? But he sent whatever he could, and then nothing was heard after that. <clears throat> Next slide. So we grew up, I grew up in Massachusetts. There's his omen as he ages. Now he's Samuel. In the back is my brother. To the right is me. I used to be very young. <laughs> and my mother. Get over the bows, right? Look at that, 1950s, 1960s with the bows. I would never be caught dead wearing it <laughs> anymore. So um, my, we continued to, um, let's see. Samuel never spoke that night, and night after night, he would sit very quietly in his easy chair, davening. Those of you who are Jewish would know that davening is that he would sit and he would read the Bible, he would read all parts of the, uh, the commentaries. He read the Zohar. He was a very scholarly man by night, uh, all in Hebrew, um, and he was very well educated. And he was always davening and chuckling, which means that you sit like this and you kind of say your prayers very, very quietly. And we grew up very orthodox in this, band, in this home. He lived a life of contrast. By night, a biblical scholar. By day, a junk dealer hanging out with rough crowds, going out for beers, talking to people very unlike himself. Nonetheless, he fit in. Sam died in 1983, and I became a professor of sociology. And I started to study the dynamics of wife battering and child abuse. And I began to work with perpetrators. Why I was drawn to perpetrators, I never put together. Why was I interested in why people are violent against each other? Why do men batter women? I was most curious about the dynamics of abuse. And now I understand where all that came from, from my childhood. But, um, and I also, at a certain point, became a visiting scholar at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. By the way, next week you are going to have the premier person scholar on why people commit atrocities. Uh, Christopher Brown, he's next week. You are in for a treat. This man is scholar extraordinaire. And um, I was a visiting scholar at the museum where he was lecturing. And very interestingly, during the morning, we learned how to teach the Holocaust, which I proceeded to do later at Ithaca College. Um, but in the afternoon, we could do our own homework. We could start doing research on our own families. Next slide. And what happened was, in the, more, in the afternoon one day, I start going through an archive called Jewish Gen. And I type in my father's village, which is Kupishaka Kupiskis. And this would have been in the mid-90s. And up comes a list of all the people who were killed in my father's village on June 28, 1942. 42, yes, 42. Um, no, I'm sorry, 1941. Um, and so the list was handwritten by a public health nurse from the next town. 
And what she had done was she'd gone from house to house to house to get all the names of people who had been shot in the village that day. So I found that list. Next slide. And there on the list, chilling as it was, is the list of my family. You see Snyder Kinney, that's my grandmother, this is Lithuanian. Snyder Kalte, Alta, 28 years old. And Hersh, my uncle, it says 20, but in fact he was 17 at the time. And imagine having no documentation, no awareness of any of the details, and in 1990, coming upon this list, I wept. I called my brother and I said, you can't believe what I found. I took a copy of it and proceeded to keep it in my archives. So it's the death list from that village. 2,000 people were killed that day. Um, I didn't know all the details. All I knew was that 2,000 people were killed. And I'm not going to tell you all of the details. I'll tell you them as they unfolded in my story. So uh, on this powerful day, I, see, I open the tool, uh, this tool, and I find them. And I printed out the list and ran to the phone. A few years later, my brother called to say there was a story in the news, in the New York Times, <coughs> about a Nazi collaborator in Kupiskis, Lithuania, who was about to be deported from the United States. On January 14, 2002, the Justice Department initiated proceedings to revoke the man's citizenship. The complaint was filed that alleged that Peter John Bernis um, worked during the summer of 1941 as a deputy to Werner Lau, a Nazi-appointed mayor and police commander assigned to Kupiskis. It stated that Bernis <coughs> Um, had used his immigration to settle in Lockport, Illinois but, Illinois, but had participated directly in the process of moving condemned prisoners from jail so that they could be taken to the killing sites. According to the complaint, more than 1,000 Jewish men, women, and children were murdered. <coughs> more than 300 other local residents, among them a nine-year-old boy, were arrested and murdered as political prisoners. Bernice worked on the, in the office near the overcrowded jail where they were held without adequate food and, and were beaten before they were dead. So I called, you know, I'm, I'm this feisty Jewish woman. I called this lawyer at the Justice Department and I said, I want to know everything. Tell me what happened. And that's when I finally got the story. And the story was that all the Jews of this village were rounded up and, and those from surrounding regions as well. And so even though it said 1,000, in fact, later documentation indicates that it was 2,000 people who were rounded out. Uh, they were marched out of the town, and I later went to the town and saw it, and so you'll see what it looked like. Um, they were marched out to this pit. Aha, a pit. They were brought to a pit where they were shot, covered up with dirt and lime. Many of you have read that they threw lime into the pits because the bodies would then decay. And in fact, bodies moved for days thereafter because people were still alive under there. Now, my apologies if I'm getting graphic, but you're taking a course on genocide and Holocaust. So, you know, you knew what you were getting into. And um, this is my reality. You know, somebody once said, oh, you poor dear. And I said, I don't feel at all um, to be pitied. In fact, everybody's got a story. Some of you have alcoholic families. Some of you were beaten. Some of you were raped. Some of you were sexually assaulted. Everybody's got a story. This is my story. This is the story that turned me into who I am and the person who made me so committed to social justice that I will do it until I die. And so it's not, a tra I mean, it is a tragedy what happened to them. I'm just bearing witness to what happened to them and to all of the others who were killed during this mass genocide. So um, life went on after I found out these stories, you know. Did my day mayor go away? 
Absolutely not. In fact, they intensified for a while. Next slide. Much has been written over the years about children who become memorial candles. As I began to read about children of the Holocaust, I discovered that there are people who were designated in their family to carry the heritage, to carry the truth about what's going on, even if they don't know the details of the stories. But they have to write the injustices, that, and I have always felt that that was my responsibility. In a Holocaust family, unconsciously, someone is always chosen to be that candle. The child takes part in the parent's emotional world, assumes the burden, becomes the link between the past and the future. It was not until my late 50s that I found out that there was a name for what I was doing in my life. And I was, in com I was quite comfortable in that role. I took it on very gratefully. The house, however, that I had grown up in was dark. It was depressed. People, my mother always drew the shades, and in Yiddish they always said, you know, you, you don't let the neighbors see you, because it was the neighbors who turned people in. It was the neighbors who turned the other way and let folks die without intervening. And so it became part of our heritage to just hide and to keep things a secret. As a child, I remember sitting behind the curtain in an Orthodox synagogue. I was upstairs behind the curtain. The men were downstairs. And I remember looking at them and wanting to be part of it. But I couldn't because I was a girl. There was also a time once in my childhood when we were at a Passover table, and the table began to fall. And one of my cousins, a male cousin, said, eh, let it fall. It's the Weibische table. It's the women's table. Let it fall. And it fell. And I remember being so angry. How dare you let that happen? That was uh, my childhood. <coughs> I became a feminist. I didn't know I was a feminist. But I certainly became one because I was mistreated as a girl in the family. So I continued to fight against these kinds of oppressions. It went on for a lifetime. When my mother died, um, the will was read, and it said Elaine shall receive the diamond ring. That was hers. At the um, reading of the will, my father and my brother said no. Your, mo your mother wanted Bill to have it, your brother, uh, for his future wife. He had no future wife at the time. They were taking it from me. And it was at that moment when I had had it, right? They, I just blew my stack, and I said, I am sick of this. I'm sick of being discriminated. I was, by the time, this time I was in my 50s, I'm sick of being discriminated against. I'm tired of this kind of treatment. I'm taking this ring, and I'm never coming back, and you're never going to see me. Well, 18 months later, my father was on his deathbed, and I went back. And I said, you know, Dad, I felt like you never loved me, and that there were all kinds of difficulties between us. My brother was the favorite child because he had Yiddish. It's, he's the Kaddish. He was the man, the person who would say, the prayers over the dead, and I was a second-class citizen. My father said, oh, Elaine, you were always my, my oldest child. I really, really loved you. But he died, and his will read, Elaine shall receive $5,000 or 20% of the estate, whichever is less. So sexism is part of the fabric of my life. If somebody treats, mistreats me as a woman, I'm the first to speak up about it. But I speak of it here because it explains very much my dedication to social justice, which started with dedication to women's issues. It also helps me understand why I've always been working for people who are the underdogs. I work in prisons now for people who are black and brown and victimized by a structural condition in the prison system and the criminal injustice system because of my own victimization as a female. So all of this led me to become part of this memorial candle. Um, I think, let me go on. I have till 5.30. Okay, good. Okay, let's see the next slide. 
along the way, because I'm so involved in social justice, as uh, Diane said, um, Dr. Parnas said, we have a fabulous Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Grove here on campus. How many of you have seen it? Good. For those who, of you who have not, please go take a look at it. It's right over there on your way to the GMC on that path. And there's an eternal light, and there's a walkway, and in fact, there's brick to my family, and there's a brick to Myrna and to me and a whole bunch of us, um, because we brought it to honor all the multiple genocides that have occurred uh, during the 20th century and before, and now into the 21st. And then as a result, we were able to get a sapling from the Anne Frank tree, which is thriving and doing beautifully over there. So you should take a look at it. So this is part of my legacy as a result of being a victim or a child of a, a refugee. I never, ever, ever say that I am a child of a survivor because he got out. He didn't have to go through the trauma that people who truly survived the Holocaust did. I am second generation of, of a refugee. So, um, next, next slide. So, why did I go to Lithuania? It all happened last summer, as I say, because I was done with being the dean and done with my academic career, although I still teach part-time here. Come take my class in the fall, Intro to Soch, um, and we deal with a lot of these issues. But I decided that I would take a tour with a group called, it was a Jewish Heritage Tour. And we went to Lithuania. And Lithuania is in the middle of Eastern Europe with Poland around it and Latvia and Estonia. And on the other side is Russia. And so uh, it's, a, it's a Baltic country, um, a place I would never want to visit. And in fact, my father, when I said, Dad, let me take you there, he would say in his heavy Eastern European accent, why would I want to go there? They killed my people. So he wouldn't go with me, but my brother and I decided that we needed to go, that we needed to have, I don't like the word closure, we needed to understand. Uh, we needed to figure out what had happened there. We also needed to figure out what it had done to us, because each of us in our own way have been scarred by the experience. We've been obsessed by it our entire lives. Um, by the way, what we did discover as well was that when my father went upstairs in that apartment in Brooklyn, New York, I was 10, my brother was five. My day mare started very soon after he went upstairs. That was the place where he learned the truth of what had happened to his family. Somebody had survived and had moved to Brooklyn. And my father had found him and went to this place. I don't know who it was because we were downstairs. We were kids. So he went up and heard all the gory details of what had happened to his family, which is why he came back down a broken man. Um, but of course, we never knew any of this. So I, we go to Lithuania, and we go to fly into Vilnius, which is the capital in the lower right-hand side. We then went up to should have one of those little zappers. Do you have one of those little zappers? Oh, okay. That's okay. You see Panovitz up here? P-A-N-E-V-E-Z-Y-S. Okay. Go to the right along that road, Kupiskus. Okay? So it's in the northeast corridor of Lithuania. So we perused this whole region. We also then went to Konis, which is over here. Now, all of this state is about the size of New Hampshire. I mean, it's not very big. That ride took us three hours. So it's a, it's a small little country. Um, and it was, at the time, uh, Russian during World War II. I'm sorry, yeah, around World War II. It was part of the Soviet Union. So they spoke Russian and Lithuanian there. So um, we decided that um, it was time to go, and let me see. Let me read um, another piece. As we approached the field, we could see a series of pits 
surrounded by stone walls. There were pits. These were the pits where thousands of Jews were marched to their deaths. We had seen photographs of this horrible place with lines of people waiting patiently to go where their lives would end. Now we were actually here. The souls of those killed were under our feet. Carefully and silently, we all walked in awe of the tragedy that had taken place here. What were those killed thinking as they faced the end? Were they praying, resisting, going with friends or family? Were they alone? Were they frightened? Were they at peace? What was their experience as they faced the reality that it was all about to end? We were in Panerai, the largest killing place in Lithuania. Next slide. Um, before, uh, my chronology is a little off. Why don't you go back? Thank you. Um, Panerai, many of us, when we think of um, the Holocaust, think of concentration camps. That's where you immediately go because that's the most publicized. But in fact, that is not all that happened to Jews during World War II. Many of them were killed by roving killing teams. Roving killing teams called Einsatzgruppen. And they followed the Russian army. As the Russian army, I'm sorry, the Nazis, uh, as, as they're coming from Germany, which is over here, they move through Eastern Europe as the, uh, the Nazi soldiers do as they're moving towards Moscow, which is over in the northwest uh, quadrant over here. So as they're moving forward, behind them come the Einsatzgruppen. And the Einsatzgruppen are roving killing teams, and Christopher Browning wrote a fabulous book that you're going to hear about next week called Ordinary Men. And in that book, he, into, he read the transcripts of interviews of men who were in these roving killing te fields, teams, asking them or hearing how they got um, socialized to become such perpetrators. And he'll explain it far better than I, but he describes how the first time they might have felt terrible doing it, you know, that they knew what they were doing and it was awful, but they got drunk and they were also pushed on by their buddies and there was peer pressure and all the things that people do when they commit terrible deeds in a group think. And so the Einsatzgruppen were the ones who came through and moved through. Now they invaded in Lithuania in June, the, uh, June 20th, 1941, and moved on through. My family was killed on June 28th. So in a matter of just a few days, they had created these killing places all over the country. Now we can see the next slide. We went to a museum where um, one of the guard, one of the uh, generals from this time, um, decided decided to send a um, a letter back to Germany, and in that letter he says. Um, and he is called the Standenführer. His name was Karl Jaeger. He writes to his superiors in Germany with great pride about how he had wiped out large numbers of Jews in a short period from June to December of 1941. The letter's details were chilling, attesting to the ruthlessness of the Einsatz group and the Roman killing teams who followed the German soldiers. Most of the country's Jews were killed in the first phase of the Holocaust. By the end of 1941, 175,000 of 200,000 Jews in the country were dead. 175,000 out of 200,000. The other 25,000 were moved into two ghettos, the Vilna ghetto and the Kovna ghetto, and I'll speak about those in a little while. Um, where they were engaged in forced labor to contribute to the German uh, killing. Um, and then in the last phase, after they were no longer of use, from 19, uh, April of 1943 to mid-July of 1944, 
The ghettos were liquidated and the last of the Jews were killed off. By the time they were done, 5,000 Jews existed in Lithuania out of 200,000. They killed off all of them, including my family, of course. Um, very few made it to the concentration camps. While we were also, so this is that man's letter. It's a translation of his letter, very pridefully telling the story. While we were also at this uh, Holocaust Museum, they decided to show us what it was like to be hiding while you were uh, waiting for the Nazis to come and get you. And so they put us in an attic, uh, a small little place. <coughs> About 10 of us could sit there at a time. And it was very, very frightening. Although we were in a space for only a short time, I was appalled. Cramped in it with 10 other people, it felt claustrophobic and it confined. I could hardly breathe. I began to sweat even though it was cool outside. I felt viscerally frightened. My skin crawled and I wanted to cry. I stopped breathing and felt as if I was going to die in those few short moments. I could hardly wait to get out, taking quite a while to recover my equanimity. I couldn't imagine what it must have been like to hide there for months in a place like that to avoid the Nazi roundups. And yet, these hiding places existed all over Lithuania, where people tried to save themselves from the inevitable. So I was on a pilgrimage. That's what I was doing on this trip. I was on a pilgrimage, and a pilgrimage takes you outside of yourself. I felt, I was only there for eight days, it felt like 80 days. It was so intense, it was so powerful. Every day, another experience of learning the things that I had never known, feeling things I had never felt. The story had always been a story. It was my father's story. It was the family story. It wasn't my story. Now it was real. I walked the fields that my father had walked. I saw the places where everyone had been killed. I hid the way they hid. There but for where I was born and the time I was born, that could have been me. And it was very, very, very powerful. I wept a great deal of the time because it was so powerful. Next slide. We went to Panerai. Now, Panerai is the largest killing place in Lithuania. It was there, let me see, I think it was 35,000 people were killed in this place. Um, so, why don't you, uh, so this is the main uh, memorial as you're entering. The, it's like a, uh, you drive up, there's a parking lot, there's a train right by there where people were brought by train and the trains are still running. And you walk in there, nothing's in English, it's only in, in Hebrew uh, and in Lithuania and Russian. And by the way, it doesn't say Jews were killed here. It says that Lithuanian citizens were killed here, or Russian citizens, because they're not going to own up to the fact that it was 35,000 Jews who were killed here. Right? They say it's Soviet citizens who were killed. Next slide. This is the memorial that we went to and we said Kaddish. Kaddish, for those of you who don't know, is the memorial or the prayer for the dead. We lit candles and we stood there, all 25 of us, singing an ancient and beautiful song that we all wept as we said it. Next slide. This is one of the pits. Beneath this pit, 35,000 people are dying, are dead, lying under there. And we stood there. And again, we just kind of looked out. And by the way, under it is a lot of sand. And the story was that there were five workers who were there always digging and putting people in the sand. And one time, they were able to save themselves, and they tunneled out and ran to the forest. So out of 35,000 who were killed, five people were able to survive Panerai and ran to the woods and saved themselves with the... Um, uh, the underground. Next slide. This is a view from a distance as you're walking into it. And that's the way it looked, because it had been sand pits. Um, and so they didn't change them, they just turned them into killing fields. And uh, next slide. Oh, all right. Back. And then I'll tell you this story. 
So um, how it felt. This visit made obvious to me why I'd come. No longer was the show or an artifact of history. No longer was the death of my family just a story. Here's where it began. This is a place where that moved me deeply. We walked gingerly, walked, spoke softly, often in tears. There was a place to worship, to weep, and to mourn for all of those who had perished. None of us had ever been anywhere like it, although later on our trip, being in a place like this became a common Lithuanian experience. The only experience that may have come close to this for me was visiting the slave dungeons in Ghana, where thousands had spent their lost days on the African continent before being sent off to slavery. It also reminds me very much of what it's like when you're in prison. The next day, next slide. Oh, by the way, everybody else went out dancing that night. I couldn't go dancing. There was a Jewish community event, and there was a dinner, and I had had it. And I went to the, mark the main square of Vilnius and sat there watching people and wrote in my journal because it had been probably one of the most powerful days of my life, except maybe when my daughter was born. That was probably more powerful. But otherwise, it was incredibly deep. Um, but the next day, we get up and we keep going, right? We've got eight days of this. Every day is like this. Imagine yourself every day getting up to something like this. It's shocking, but it was worth it. The next day, we go to an archives. And it's the National Archives, and it's a pretty cool place. I mean, they had illuminations from the 5th century, and they had all kinds of documents and kings and queens, coronation documentation. But we went down into the archives, and the archivist said to us, over there are all the shtetl records. That's the little villages, shtetl. And they said, go. Can you imagine being allowed to go into the SSU stacks, right down into the, the tombs of it. They don't let you in, right? They send that little cart to go get things for you. But we could go down in there. And so I look at the wall, and there's Kupiskis, the town. So I pull the book off the shelf, I open it up, and I said to my brother, Bill, uh, what year were Althea and Herschel born? And my brother knew. And one of them, uh, Herschel, was born in 1929. So I open the book, and the first inscription is my Uncle Herschel's birth record. Talk about synchronicity, or fortuitous, or beshert, or God knows what you want to call it. But there it was, and it's all, of course, in Lithuanian, but I could see Herschel Snedeke, and I could see Yentelea, my grandmother, and I could see Eliezer, and I could see who the person who did the circumcision was. His name was on there. And it, would, again, was chilling for me that I was really in my family's world, if you will. So then uh, we just left, went, and uh, I had never seen it before. I'm sorry, he was born in 1924, not 1929. And I opened it, and there, were, there was his name. OK, next slide. We then went the, that same day to the Vilna Ghetto. Now, the Vilna Ghetto was the largest ghetto. In fact, there were two, the big ghetto and the little ghetto. And you remember I told you with three phases, the first phase, they came in and they killed as many as they could. The second phase, they moved people to the ghettos. The first phase, they killed off who was ever in the ghetto. So the Vilna Ghetto was a place where uh, probably about fifteen to 20,000 people were living in these uh, areas where the locals had been moved out and the Jews had been moved in into these very claustrophobic little uh, conditions. And it was uh, probably about a mile uh, radius. Um, and then the other one was on the other side, the small ghetto, and that was probably a half of a, half a mile. And we started to walk through the ghetto where people would been, had been hiding. They had to have passports. <coughs> to get out. And there had been checkpoints and walls built all around it. And as I'm walking along, you know, and I'm feeling very depressed by what I had seen, I look up on a wall in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how they even could create this symbol, but it's a Star of David's resistance in the middle of the ghetto. 
And I was actually quite taken with it because I could see that even as people were living under the worst possible conditions, and even as they were many being taken out and killed on a daily basis, there were people underground trying to bring it resistance. And there's some wonderful biographies. Avi Kovna was one of the resistance leaders in um, Vilna Ghetto, and his biography tells the story of doing these kinds of actions. The other thing, next slide, people would hide in the sewers, and then they would push up the manhole covers, come up out of the sewers, con conduct an action of some sort against the Gestapo, against the Nazis, and then go back under the sewers and hide and live. And this went on for the two years that, or I think it was, yeah, three years that the Vilna Ghetto actually was in existence, and then it was liquidated. So you could see that people did not go as willing victims to their own demise. There was resistance all the way along, and you should know from the history of the Holocaust that people were not willing victims. They went and they, owned, they had very limited choices. And when they had a choice, they could fight, would fight back as much as they possibly could. At least the young people did. Some of the old ones had given up hope. Many of them kept agreeing or helping the Nazis, thinking if they just kept doing what they were told, they would eventually be saved, not to be saved at all. But there was this sense that if they could only uh, make accommodations, ultimately they might live. Next slide. So we went to Kupiskus, all right? That was on our fifth day, fourth day there. We got into what we would call our little roots tours, like a heritage tour. And there were seven people out of the 25 who wanted to go to the region I showed you on the map. And so this is my brother and myself, and we are just arriving in Kupiskus. That's the bus station. And um, actually, let me tell you a funny little story about that bus station. I had to go to the bathroom. We'd been on the car for three hours, and so there was the bus station. I said, pull in here. We're going to use the bathroom. So I go in, and I pay my lita, which is the local currency, and uh, the woman opens the bathroom for me, and I use the facilities, and I come out, and there's an altercation going on outside with the other women of my group, and the keeper of the bathroom is yelling, screaming at them that they should give her more money, more money, more money. And our translator came over, and she was quite wonderful, and she pointed out that they had already given five lita. I had given one already, and then they gave five more, and there were only four women. So she already had six lita for four women. She couldn't add. She couldn't add how many people and how much money. And later, my brother and I walked out and we said, you'll pardon the pun, you cannot piss in Kupiskis. <laughs> <laughs> and my father had always said, don't you go there. You will not be welcome. And my brother pointed out, damn it, he was right. We were not welcome in Kupiskis, right? But we were there nonetheless. So, um, Next slide. We had done our homework before we came, and we had known that the Soviets had bulldozed the Jewish cemetery, where my grandfather, who had died earlier, was buried. And what the Soviets did was they built water towers. Uh, those of you who study Soviet history, there are water towers all over Eastern Europe that they built for, I'm not sure why, maybe they keep water, but they wiped out local conditions and built water towers. So we knew to look for the water tower to find the cemetery. To the right is what's left of the Jewish cemetery. So my grandfather was buried someplace in that area, and so we went towards it. We had no idea where the killing place was of my family. However, as we looked to the right, there was a memorial. Next slide. And this was the memorial that was to the Soviet citizens who were killed in Kupiskis on this day in 1941. 
And um, we realized we had come to the place where the killing had taken place. Now imagine, I have in my head a pit, right? Like in Panerai. So that's what I'm conjuring up in my head. Next slide. Instead, we come to this garden, this beautiful garden that you go down the stairs, to the top is the water tower, to the right is this walkway and this beautiful garden. Next slide. No, nope. yeah, right there. And then you come down these stairs, and that's the killing place, that green field right there. It's not what I imagined, right? Not at all. Beyond it is the River Koopa, the small river that runs through the town that my dad had always told me he would cross with his horse, Charlie. And so I was in the place of my family's killing. I also could see the river where he had played as a child, but it was nothing like I imagined, right? I was expecting falling into that abyss of my childhood dream, daymare. Instead, I found this. We went to the bottom, next slide, and we said Kaddish. That man is not a member of the family, but my brother and I. My brother brought the prayer books, and we said Kaddish as we were. Uh, and the Kaddish was to all of them. And then as we're saying Kaddish, and it's been a lovely day, the sky opens and it rains. It pours on our heads. Now, who knows why, right? I still haven't figured it out. It just rained, okay? So we go running back to the van. My brother stops and says Kaddish at our grandfather's grave somewhere up there. We couldn't actually find um, what it looked like or where it was, but nonetheless, we, um, he said Kaddish. And then we got in the van, and that was over. And it was sort of anticlimactic, right? It was like, that's it? That's what I came all this way for? This field, this river, this memorial? There must be more. Well, we continued our journey. Next slide. This is the village of Kupiskis in 1920s when my father was growing up. Next slide. This is the village today, shot in the same direction. So to the left, over here on the left, is a memorial wall, a, a, a library. Next slide. Another, just another view. By the way, the, my family's home would be down this street around the corner and over in this direction, because we knew where they lived. They lived at 52 Gadamas, and we went to 52 Gadamas. The house had been torn down. Unfortunately, uh, there was nothing to be seen, except what I saw was my family had been prosperous. They owned a very, a big parcel of land in a fairly substantial neighborhood with nice houses all around it, a cop came out from next door because the town hall and the town jail were right next door to the house, and the cop said the house had actually been a um, home for the indigent and homeless. So I was relieved by that because I discovered then that it hadn't been expropriated by, appropriated by the, um, the uh, Lithuanians. In fact, it had been used for good purposes, I felt more vindicated, if you will. And someone asked me, do I want to go back and own land in Lithuania? Because we still went, the answer was, like my father, why would I want to go there? Because I could have citizenship, dual citizenship. I could be a member of the EU, which is not a bad idea. But um, I don't want to go back to Lithuania. I might go back for more research, but I certainly don't want to own land in Lithuania. Next slide. So 10 years ago, my brother and I had contributed to the building of a memorial wall in the town library. And we had contributed a decent amount of money so that the wall could be built. And the names on the wall were the names of the, the same list of names that had been taken off the list that the public health nurse had developed in 1941 when uh, she went from house to house to house. So this is the wall, next slide. Oops, back, sorry. 
over in the right, I didn't include this slide, but my family's names are included exactly the way they looked on the handwritten list. And on the bottom of this wall, it says who contributed, and there's my name, my brother's name, my nephew, my daughter, and all of us who had in some way tried to memorialize the folks who had died that day. Next slide. Behind the library, turns out, was the town synagogue where my father, as a child, had had his bar mitzvah. And so this is the shul my father dabbled in and learned all of his religious um, activities. So that was pretty important. And then, next slide, we went out for lunch. And in Lithuania, as in Eastern Europe, you eat borscht. If you've never eaten borscht, it's fabulous. It's a cold beet soup, and uh, they put cre um, sour cream in it. Next slide. And we had rye bread, right? So we had an Eastern European a lunch. And then, next slide. OK. We leave. We just leave Lithuania. We, the next day, we went to the Kogna ghetto. Then we just leave. And I thought to myself, after I get home, I turned 70 last summer, which is a momentous year. You were now no, no longer able to die young. <laughs> um, you know, I was now up there. And I thought, I just had this momentous experience. And yet, it doesn't make sense to me. Nothing really resonated. It was good, but what did it mean? And so. Let me describe what happened, because this part I think I need to read to you. Soon after my return from Lithuania, it was my 70th birthday. As is my ritual, I attended a meditation with a guide who helps me to see where I am and where I might be heading. It was held in a rustic mountain retreat called Light on the Hill, not far from Ithaca, New York, where I used to live. There is a pond, and a serene nature surrounds us. We can access places I do not allow myself to go without help. I told my guide about my day mare and my trip to Lithuania. As the rain pelted the small hut, I was reminded of the downpour at the killing place of my family. It was a perfect setting for my attempt to make some sense of my experience. Alice asked me to imagine my day mare pit and the usual falling into infinity. Naturally, I resisted such a suggestion, but I always trust her. I try to allow myself to go where I do not generally allow myself to go. I fell and fell and fell as I had in the past. In fact, I kept falling for quite a while. My day mare is so familiar, it is where I always go. But finally, I stopped falling. I could see a small light ahead. The infinity I'd always imagined was not so infinite after all. The downward spiral began to open up, and I came into the light. I was no longer in my body. I was a spirit. The place I entered was lovely, with a bright, bright blue sky and puffy white clouds. Alice told me that Buddhists say that the image represents nirvana. As I exited my spiral of infinity, I was met by my old childhood friend, Michael, whom I used to see sitting in the synagogue with my father and the other men. Michael died many years ago, but here he was welcoming me to this place. I didn't even ask where I was. I went willingly because I trust him. In the background, I could see my mother and my father, but they didn't approach. Instead, Michael told me there were some people who wanted to meet me. I was met by my murdered ancestors. As my grandmother, Yentalea, my aunt, Althea, and uncle, Herschel came, Herschel, came toward me, they wordlessly told me that they were all right and in a good place. They said I no longer had to be the memorial candle I had been my entire life. They indicated that I had done my job and now it was finished. Their lives had ended. They were 73 years away from the atrocities. Their spirits were free, and mine should be as well. 
I realized that Althea's name meant healing, and I was about to begin my own. A great sense of relief came over me, and I felt at peace. I had done what I was supposed to do, but no longer had the obligation to honor and work for justice in their names. In actuality, I have a hard time letting go of that identity and still not sure that I will, but I was sure that I was released from the tragedy that had plagued me for my entire life. I've been back for a while now. I've not had the day man, nor have I been depressed by its loss. I still feel compelled to tell my family's story, but it's now a story that has an ending. I may not fall down the pit into infinity upon my own death, my ancestors' lives are remembered and honored. I will forever memorialize their story and will still work to stop such atrocities from ever happening again. I might, may not be able to, but I still feel compelled to try. It has been a life of pilgrimage, but I think the pilgrimage is over. I can now live my life free of their pain and suffering. This is a gift. Thank you. Actually, the Torah, I think, says, I can't remember, somebody who knows the Torah better, I don't know at all, told me that it takes 60 years after an atrocity for it to be discussed. Wow. So that's why we're now talking about it. About 10, 15 years ago, we started to really talk about it. Yeah. How about more questions? Come on, from the students. Well, I'll take, I'll take it. Could you repeat the author and the title? I don't remember the title, but it's Arlene Stein. Yes, Stein. Stein. Yes. Are there any more family members that like family? In my family, no. I don't think my brother would consider it. Uh, there's just my brother and me. I mean, part of the thing about Holocaust families is there's no family. You know, I mean, I had my father, I had my mother, and my mother's side. I didn't tell my mother's story. On her side, um, she lost about. 50 cousins and uncles and aunts. So it wasn't as close as this, and she was born in the US, so we had family from her side. But there's no one, there's no family. And I only have one child, and my brother had one child. So we're pretty much the end of the line. Can you speak on the involvement of the Lithuanian populace? Yes, they were. Willing collaborators, the Lithuanian populists, uh, uh, population. There were some people, and in fact, we went to a few museums. I think there are 120 people who were honored as righteous Gentiles from Lithuania, who actually did do something to save people's lives. But for the most part, they went in, uh, many of the locals went in and looted um, the homes as soon as people left. They also gave up names to uh, the local authorities 
and Bernus, the guy who, the Bernus from the Kupiscus, Kupiscus, which is the story I know the best, had just graduated high school. So it was a young man who was collaborating with the Nazis because he saw who was winning and he wanted to curry favor. So, um, yeah, you know, there's a wonderful book, what's it called, Neighbors? And it's about Latvia, I don't know, Poland? Poland. Poland. And it's about how the Polish citizenry collaborated and gave up folks. And nobody's done the research yet in that way um, about Lithuania. There's a very good book by Ellen Cassidy about the Lithuanian Holocaust. It's called We Are Here, which was a song that uh, the partisans sang uh, as they were hiding in the woods and fighting the Nazis as best they could. We Are Here by Ellen Cassidy, and I highly recommend it. It's where I really learned a lot of my history. And if any of you know anything about publishing, I'm now trying to get my story published. I've written it, and I'd be happy to send you a copy of it if you send me an email, and I can send it to you. Yes? It's so small, the Jewish community in Lithuania. It's quite tragic, actually. We went to several, I didn't even report on that. Uh, we went in Lithuania the first night of when everyone was going dancing. They went dancing in the Jewish community center, where there are 50 families, basically, who, for Vilnius, which is the capital. Then we went to Ponovitz, which is the local next town to Kupiskis, and there are about 10 families there. And we met the guy. He didn't know any of the Jewish prayers. My brother taught him how to say Kaddish at a uh, memorial. Uh, and most of them are not from Lithuania. They've come from Russia to resettle in Lithuania. So we gave a lot of money and uh, we gave money to try to keep them going. <coughs> One of the most powerful moments of my trip, which I should have even written about, was we went to a, a Jewish day school, and it was Shabbos, it was, it was Friday, and there were little children singing all of the prayers that we all knew, and we all sang them together. And it was a, a, a moment, right? Because here they had all died, and now a whole new generation was you know, saying to Hitler, you didn't kill us. We're still here. And it reminded me, Lillian and a bunch of us here, Lillian Judd, who was a survivor, who was right here in the front row, and one of my favorite people in the world. You should stand up, Lillian. Lillian was in Auschwitz. <laughs> so Lillian's going to tell her story on March 8th. Third. Third. Where? In the uh, 3001. In Schultz, at what time? One o'clock? One o'clock. One o'clock. <laughs> Lillian's going to read from her book about her story in Auschwitz. Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon. But um, why, why did I say that? I, something about the children and, uh, and the generations and not being wiped out and the fact that... Oh, I remember. Because we had a celebration of life for survivors in 2007. Six. Six? God, that's almost nine yeah. years. Um, and where we, and I have to say it was the Alliance and uh, Barbara and Myrna, who brought out all the survivors we could find from Sonoma County. And how many showed up? 54. 54 survivors showed up in, from Sonoma County. Um, and we did a memorial there of, about our family, but then we danced. And talk about a powerful experience that was. We were dancing to klezmer music and saying, Hitler, the hell with you, we won, you didn't. And that we're still going on. More questions? Come on, students. You must want to know something about this. Yes? Um, on, the, on one of the memorials, I believe it was the, uh, the sand pit, you said that the, the memorial stone had said that they, they were Soviet citizens. Or citizens. Yeah, that was added later. Okay. Was it in Yiddish? Probably in Yiddish. Yeah, that was added later. The original ones all over the country said Soviet citizens. And in the last 10 years, the Jewish community has started saying, hey, that's not who it was. I mean, yeah, there were Lithuanian citizens who were communists who were killed, but not to the number that the Jews were killed. 
Thank you for asking and clarifying. Very interesting because the same holds in Poland. Oh yeah. In Krakow, you have these massive uh, monuments to killed Soviet citizens, and um, the very tiny Jewish memorials that have more recently been erected. Right. And I, my understanding and I'm is whether that's true for all of Eastern Europe. Yeah. So, and now there's a movement to sort of own who it is, but. My, I mean, I haven't been to other Eastern European countries. It's the official Soviet line. It was. It was the official yeah. Soviet line. Oh, since World War II. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know of anyone besides your father and his uncle, was it? If you don't know any more of them, survived? Nobody survived. The uncle that he came to work with got here in the 1920s. So, no, no, nobody survived. Um, and that, that was part of, you know, like people would sometimes have big family gatherings and I would have four of us. And often, I, I often felt deprived, you know, why couldn't we just be having Hanukkah events, you know? But with my mother's family as well, they were all killed um, in Poland. Uh, so we didn't have extended family on either side. Uh, my grandmother was deported from Berlin to Kronos and killed at Fort Nine. Fort Nine. Were you there? Yes. That was one of the memorials that I didn't include. Um, Fort Nine is, that is probably one of the ugliest memorials I've ever seen in my life. Have you seen pictures of it? It has three, you know, uh, Stevenson Hall and uh, Darwin Hall are, the architecture is called Brutalist. Uh, it's a Soviet form of architecture from the 1950s, right? And they're ugly, they are brutal. Well, that's what you see in Eastern Europe when you go, that kind of architecture. And the Fort Nine was where many people were sent for prison and walked through it. And then there's a memorial, and there's the way of death where they walked unto their deaths. And then there's a memorial where you say Kaddish and you light candles and all the rest. But off in the distance, and I do have a picture of it on my iPhone, I can show it to you. With, there are three stark trees growing. One is short, one is medium, and one is large. The short one shows dead bodies. The middle one shows people fighting, I think it is. And the third one, the tall one, shows people surviving. Or maybe it's vice versa. But it's um, graphic and brutal and ugly as hell. I mean, you look at it against a stark sky, and you think, who created this? What kind of beauty is this? And it's really very touching and powerful, but nothing you'd want in your garage, in your backyard. So thank you for asking. I'll show you some pictures from Fort Nine. Yeah, a little louder. No, because it was underground. So, but I found out about it later, and it turns out it's a right-wing organization people want to. Uh, I was a little appalled, actually. Um, but he was, um, it, he was recruited, it was called Beitar. Any of you know the history of uh, Zionism? Beitar was to the right of any of the other Zionists, to the right of other Zionists, you know Beitar. Yeah, so when I found out he was part of it, I was sort of surprised, but. Um, it, uh, it actually uh, was recruiting people to go to Israel, Palestine at the time, and it was also a uh, pretty militant, I mean, I don't think they themselves carried guns, but they were shipping guns to the area at the time. And I find it quite amusing because I have a very good friend here who's Palestinian, and we're friends, and yet our histories are so very different and we come from such different places and respect each other from where we come from. So. Yes? Wasn't the film Defiant filmed in, in the Lithuanian? Which one? The film Defiant. I thought it was Poland. No, it was no, Lithuania. It was Lithuania. Yeah, it was the Lithuanian. That was a Partisan. very good movie. Yes, yeah, Partisan Resistance. Yes, I, I would recommend that yes. film. Do you want to say something about it? Well, it's just a wonderful film about three brothers who were full family. Yeah. And the Lithuanian. 
Right, and the partisans of Lithuania would not let the Jewish partisans <laughs> meet with them. But these guys did manage to bridge the gap enough to, to work at some point. It's a very good movie. Yeah. I would recommend yeah. uh, get it on your Netflix list. It's called yeah. Defiance. The books are good. What's that? The books are the better. Books are the books are better. better. But the one of the most important things is that they saved yeah. many Jews and hid them in the forest right. and set up family camps. Right. And the bizarre thing, I mean, you know what it's like in New England right now, the weather? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's like in Lithuania in winter. I mean, we're not talking Northern California weathers. <laughs> we're, we're talking heavy duty winter, living outdoors, building huts and building caves and, you know, fires with whatever they could find, but they couldn't build fires because then they'd be seen, and, so, and what were they eating, and they would have to steal, but then they would have to put food away. I mean, just imagine any of us trying to live in those conditions. Every time I was in any of these places, I thought, I would not have survived. They would have picked me out of the crowd and said, send her, give her a bullet. Um, because I would not have had the stamina to put up with what these folks put up with. Others, please, ask me the questions. Uh, do you know if your father made to the big part of that Megan or Jasinski? Uh, no. <laughs> no, that was good. You, you know your history better than I. <laughs> I'm going to talk about it here. <laughs> okay. No, it was not. That was the year good. And my father was not in the year good. He was in Betar. They were the founders. Pardon me? Jabotinsky was the founder of Was he? Mm -hmm. But I thought he was here good. Yeah, when he moved to Mendes. Okay. So tell me my history. I don't know that. And did Maytar become here good? Yeah, it was, the, it was a European uh, right wing science organization that eventually migrated with Benjamin when he moved to Israel. Thank you. Yeah. I hadn't done my homework on that one. I should add that to my story. Thank you very much. And if you come and tell me more, I'd, I'll, I'd like to know more. How about others? Anybody? Come on, we got ten more minutes. You got to squeeze it out of this. Thank you. So, so you know, your story has two parts. It's a personal story, but it's a historical story that we're sharing. And so, but there's a lot of duality. So I've noticed that you describe your father um, both with. So you start with your story with your father. I mean, you mentioned that you know you were. You were um, resentment for sexism, but there seems to be a lot of pride in the scholarship. Um, what did you feel about your scholarship um, as you evolved? <laughs> if I was married and could make Kala and have a grandchild, he was happy. Uh, he died in 1983. I got my PhD in 1985. So uh, I was getting my degree in spite rather than in support of. I think it truly comes out of the scholarship of my family. I mean, I, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think it was just part of it. My family was scholarly. Uh, my grandfather was an itinerant of a merchant who went to South Africa and spoke Afrikaans uh, and traveled from Lithuania down to South Africa and back and all over Europe. And he dobbins and did all this uh, religious activity as well. I, you know, I forgive my family. They are products of their generation and their place and their time. I don't, I, I, in the 60s, I had the name Fury. I was pretty pissed. You know, I don't feel that way anymore. I understand. I, I didn't like it, but I understand that they, were, he was brought up that way in this old world and I was troubled. I was troubled from the time I was a little girl. I just was always knew what I wanted to do, and I did it. And, you know, he, uh, but they, I made him happy. I married a Jewish guy. Turns out he was gay. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a Jewish daughter. So uh, I am proud of him. I really am. When I think of all that he did and, and how he had to hide who he was, I feel very proud of him. What's that? Lynn is a top down. Lynn, oh, you know Lynn? Lynn, Lynn, the city of Sid. You never come out the way you go in. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. It's a tough working class town. So I'm curious. Uh, you had talked about early on about the fact that there were no concentration camps uh, in Lithuania. Now, I also did a news trip on the U.S. One was easy in there. Saw, you know, but the other was just a tiny village. Uh, it's there today. 
in Poland? Today it's Ukraine. It was Poland when my father was born there. And uh, in, in this town, there actually is one store and a bus stop. And the chickens are still pecking the road in front of the bus stop. Just to give you a feeling of what it's like today. Uh, but in, in our uh, uh, trip, and we were uh, very fortunate that our next door neighbor was a very famous Holocaust scholar. And so he was able to give us a lot of information. And one of the things that we learned was that a lot of concentration camps, uh, the Nazis started losing or pulling them down because they didn't want to be discovered. They want the evidence. And then many of them, some of them were discovered. And there are monuments there and so on. But so my, and, and because you know, I was concentrating on Poland and uh, this one part of Ukraine, Galicia, because that's where my father's family was. So, I mean, we sort of know about, you know, kind of what happened there when visiting some concentration camp sites and so on. But, so in Lithuania, though, I think things happened later. Um, no, it was earlier. earlier. No, it was earlier. It was earlier. Rachel was the big year. June 1941. Yeah. So they so, pushed our friends. So were there never concentration camps? No. They're only killing fields, and then they got moved to concentration yeah. camps if they survived. But yeah. first, they were in the ghettos. Do you have some stories? Uh, the, um, by 1942, over a million Jews had been murdered before Auschwitz was in Germany. Yeah, the Einsatz group. And actually, Hitler and the gang planned a large death camp, the largest Auschwitz, along the Danica River in Vienna Roots. But when they went there to do it, Jusupal Hart went in, and the Holocaust and Genocide Studies journalist, it's about 10 years ago. Uh, when they went there to build it, it was so infested with mosquitoes, it was so swampy, uh, and they realized that they, just, they couldn't pull it off. So I, I'm not, not sure exactly if that was before they decided to use the Einsatz group. It probably was. Well, I have to say, when I was reading about this, particularly uh, Ellen Cassidy's book, she argues, as do other scholars, that the whole idea for the, the, uh, the I can't remember which the phrase was, they were testing things out in Lithuania. Yeah, yeah. But they, Lithuania was where they tried out different things to see what worked. And then they, they started with the Einsatz group in there. And then they moved on through. So it was a test country. And, they, and they that the Einsatz group in groups would have been tried or would have had a trial as many of the other death camps and concentration camps had trials specific to that area. Yes. They couldn't do that in the Soviet Union because the Soviet what they were not willing to uh, <coughs> carry those out. Right. Others. They didn't know as much. Yeah. Well, let's take the student first, for Um You said that uh, uh, when you were talking about how you could get citizenship in Lithuania, you said you might go back for research. Uh, is, is there anything that you feel that you that you missed on your uh, first trip there, or is there anything that, that you, you learned about later that you'd like to go and Yes, that's a good question. Um, let me say, the people that I went with on this trip, there were 25 of them, all of them are in some way scholarly on this. They've really done their homework. They know the genealogies, and they know. I didn't do that. My brother did some of it, but I'm kind of experiential. Take me, I'll see, and then I'll learn. Um, and I realized that uh, I would love to interview people in Kupiskis who might have known my family. I did interview one woman who was a child, and I interviewed her in Yiddish. The two of us communicated. It was really very touching. I have a friend here. I did better Loretta when I was there than I do now. Uh, my Yiddish is very difficult. But I, I was able to communicate. She told me about the village in Yiddish. I would really like to go back and interview people in the town. Uh, I am less sort of a genealogy kind of a scholar and more of a, uh, an ethnography scholar. I like narratives, so I would probably just want to hear stories. I am really curious about what happened that day. The rounding up, the separating, the taking them there. You know, what were the details? I, I still don't, I kind of know a little more, but I don't know the details, so I would like to go back to that. I'd also like to go back and really meet some other different communities to see how they dealt with it, talk to some of the people um, who might have you know, known my family. They were a pretty prosperous family. They owned a shop 
and the farm. So that kind of thing. So, and a lot of the, the people in my group, some of them have gone back two or three times. This was like their third trip. Because it's like peeling an onion. You know, the more you peel, the more there is there. And I, I did not expect this, but it is a beautiful country. Beautiful with lakes. It reminded me truly of New Hampshire. I'm from the East Coast. Rolling hills and beautiful fields and forests and, you know, lovely uh, old world uh, experience. I, mean, I recommend Eastern Europe. I'd like to go to Latvia and Estonia now. Who the hell have ever heard of going to Latvia and Estonia except for Loretta? My friend who goes there. But um, I want to go there now because it's a really fascinating place. So that's my answer. Now we're ready. I'm curious, you talk so much about your father, and you don't talk about your mother. Well, this is his story and my story. Uh, I could tell the story of Ida Rosenfield, uh, but hers is not as compelling as this one. She comes from an immigrant family. She didn't speak English. She grew up in the U.S., born in the U.S., didn't speak English until she went to public school. Uh, was really an old world kind of a woman and truly the wife. She was the cook. She was the, you know, the bala posta. Um, and she was very emotionally needy. And so uh, I, I didn't feel that this is, at all, that this was her story. She didn't play a role. It feels much more distant, you know. Those uh, my mother's side of the family, my mother's mother's side of the family had twelve children. Four went to stay in Russia or Poland, Soviet Union. Four went to Israel and founded the state of Israel, and four came to the United States. That's, yeah, and became doctors and lawyers and judges and psychologists. And I feel like my mother's family is much more the history of 19th and 20th century Jewry than it is that individual story. I have a cousin who's a sociologist. We've often said we should write the Tolpin story because we really represent what happened to those people uh, through World War II and before. Oh, they all came here. The last crowd just got here about 20 years ago, after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, and my mother brought a lot of them over. And they'd been members of the Communist Party in Russia and in the Soviet Union. And, um, and the first batch, my grandmother came in the 1920s. So the whole range. I mean, there were 12 of them, so they came in different batches. Most of them are now here, except the Israeli ones. They stayed there. Other questions? <laughs> Well, I've kept you long enough. Oh, wait, no, no. What, what time is this class? All right, one more question, just to round it up. And then if you have any more questions or want to say anything, please come up and see me, OK? There's one student question right there. Yes, I was going to get it. Yes. Yeah. why she, no. It, whatever I wanted to do, I did. I was in the civil rights movement. I got busted in anti-war movement. I, you know, I dated black men. I mean, whatever it was that was going to scare the hell out of my mother, I did it. And so, no. Um, I think eventually she was proud of me, but she didn't know what to make of me because no, I was not a conventional young Jewish girl. <laughs> On that note, thank you, Elaine.